Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just watching over us throughout the whole week. And we thank you for enabling us to be able to have this Zoom Bible study. Father God, at this time, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be with each and every one of us, wherever we may be. Even though we may be far apart from each other right now, God, I pray that you'll just gather all of our hearts and our minds and our souls together in your word so that we can receive the blessings that you have in store for us. God, I pray that you'll be the one preaching this message and that you will open our hearts and touch our hearts and seal us with your word so that we may be protected in these end times. Thank you so much. Please be with us until the end of the Bible study. Help us to focus on your word. And I pray that you will protect and guard us so that darkness may not be able to penetrate into this hour, so that this may be a time where we have true fellowship with you, Lord. We thank you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, see, I knew this would happen. After I pray, there's people waiting for us. Okay. All right. So today we're continuing in our study that we start, started last week. The title is uh, Study of Genesis 1. This is part two. So I'm just going to briefly review just what we learned last week. Um, so first we said that the Bible is not a science book, right? The Bible is not uh, really interested in teaching us all the scientific details of creation. So what kind of book is the Bible? The Bible is a book about redemption, about redemptive history, right? So um, in one word the th or one sentence, the thesis of the Bible we said was how God redeems the fallen mankind through Jesus Christ, right? The Bible is about how God redeems mankind through Jesus Christ. So the, the whole Bible is just geared toward that goal, that focus, okay? Even Genesis 1, okay? So in Genesis 1, 1, we have this blanket statement that kind of, it's an overarching statement that summarizes the entire history of redemption. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that statement implies finishing of the work of creation. Okay, the work of creation is not finished because man has fallen. I mean, he, God finished it, but then man fell. So God has to recreate us until it's fully finished. And that, that end, that conclusion comes when man is fully created in the image of God. Right now, we do have the image of God partially, but through the fall, that image has been broken. It's been corrupted. So through Jesus Christ, he is trying to enable us. He, God is enabling us, recreating us in his image. Right? And then in Genesis 1, 2. Genesis 1, 2 has this. It says, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So here we have a description of earth now, and the earth is described as formless and void and dark. And there's just water, and the Spirit of God is moving over the surface of the water. So this is, that description in Hebrew uh, sounds like the Spirit of God is like a bird hovering or flying over the surface of the waters, trying to look for a place to land, a point of contact. But he has none. Okay? That's the state of the earth before God started actually creating, okay? So how can we understand this verse? Why is there darkness? Why is darkness the starting point, okay? Well, there are a couple of theories. Um, one is that Genesis 1-1 happened a long time ago. We don't know when, it's just a long time ago. And then between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there's a big gap. So this theory is called the gap theory. There's a big gap of years, thousands, maybe, who knows. And then after God created, the, his creation just went bad. It became formless and void and dark. And so now God has to start his recreation work. Or another theory is that before the fall of Adam, there was another fall. 
For example, we've heard of how the angel fell and became Satan, right? The angel Lucifer fell and became Satan. So that could be another fall. And because of that, the earth was now darkened, spiritually speaking. Okay. Well, whatever the theory may be, the, what the Bible points out is that the earth was already formless and void and dark. These three things were on, on the earth. And there was no point of contact for God to uh, start his work yet. Okay, so as I said before, God, when God starts his creation work in Genesis 1-3, the thing that he's trying to address are these three things. The earth is formless, it is void, which basically means that it's empty, and then it is dark. God is going to address these three issues as he starts to create. Okay, so on day one, what did he do? He created light. And he separated from darkness. So here, immediately, he addressed the issue of this, the world being dark. So he said, let there be light, and there was light. So he separated it from darkness, and he named it. He named light day, and he named darkness night. Okay, that's what Genesis 1, 3 through 5 says. So here... Uh, the six days of creation, last week I told you, the six days of creation foreshadow the entire history of redemption. Okay? So days, so for example, days, days one through six are a foreshadowing of the entire history of redemption. Because remember, we studied about the structure of the Bible, and Genesis 1 is the intro of the intro of the Bible, right? So Genesis 1 basically summarizes the entire Bible. Because, you know, when you read essays or books, in the introduction, you give a, a short summary of what the entire book's going to be about, right? You give a preview. So the Bible is the same way. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4a is the introduction of the introduction of the Bible. So that part, the six days of creation and seventh day Sabbath, that is a short summary of the entire history of redemption. So days one through six and then seventh day rest are giving us a foreshadowing of the history of redemption, redemptive history. Okay, so that's why we're studying this today for the last two weeks, right? That's why we're studying this because if we know this chapter, then we can know the entire history of redemption. So in that sense, day one, what does day one correspond to? I'm going to erase this. What is day one about? Well, day one is God started his creation work in a darkened world, and he found, he created light and named it day. And he separated it from darkness. Okay. So last week I told you that this is a story about Adam and maybe even Cain and Abel and Seth. Okay. Adam was the first person to receive the light. We learn that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, that this light refers to the light of Jesus Christ, right? This is the light of God, of the Word of God. So there was just complete darkness and just waters, no point of contact for the Spirit of God. And then God created Adam. He became the first one to receive the light, to receive the word, to receive the breath of God. Which I believe, if you have been studying with me, we learned that the breath of God symbolizes the spirit of God, right? Uh, verses like Job 33, verse 4, will teach us that. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God created... God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living being. So that, in other words, God breathed the breath of life. He gave the Spirit of God into Adam. He became a living being. God did not do that with the animals. 
in Genesis 2.19, God just formed the animals from the, dust of the, uh, from the ground, right? Who else breathed the breath of life? Jesus did in John chapter 20, verse 22. After he resurrected, he came into the room where the disciples were hiding and he said, peace be with you. And what did he do? He breathed on them. He went, and he said, receive the spirit. So he symbolically acted out what God did in Genesis 2-7. So Jesus there was basically saying, I am recreating you guys in the image of God to the disciples, right? So Adam was the first person who received the word of God, the first person who received the spirit of God. That's why he's so significant. Not because he's the first physical human being. That's not as important. He is the first person who received the word of God. And he's the first person who received the spirit of God. Okay. So that's what happened. Okay. So day one, when it says God created light, he did not create the sun until the fourth day. Right. So what, what kind of light is that? It's talking about a spiritual light. So day one is a description of what he did in the first thousand years of redemptive history from Adam to Noah. So people like Adam, Abel, Seth, Enoch, you know, Methuselah, Lamech, these are the children of faith, right? They're, they're the children of light. They're the children of the day, right? So let's look at uh, first, um, first Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5. So this is what 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5 says. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. See, it clearly says you, meaning us, right? The people who believe in Jesus, you are all sons of light and sons of day. These are the things that God created on day one, right? And he separated from the night and darkness. Okay. So who was the first son of light? It was Adam. Who was the first son of day? It was Adam. But then Cain went over to the other side, right? He was of the darkness. He was of the evil one, the Bible says. And he killed his brother Abel. So there is this separation happening, see, even from the beginning. So that's basically a sum of, summary of day one. And then day two, he created a, the firmament or sometimes it's called the expanse and then he called it heaven and he separated the waters above from the waters below okay the waters above are the clean waters and they're like clouds or moistures in the air waters below are the waters on earth that have been polluted right how can you become the waters above? How do we get clouds? When the waters below receive sun rays, sunlight, enough sunlight, then it evaporates, right? And it goes up into the air. So that's how you get the waters above, right? And this day gives us a, a, a summary description of Noah, the time of Noah and the flood. We read from Genesis chapter 7, verse 22. In chapter 8, verse 2, which talked about the gates of heaven or the windows of heaven opening and all the waters dropping down. Also, the waters from the deep coming up. So, the expanse that he created to separate the waters above and waters below, he took it back and it just came together. And that was judgment. And the, that was how the flood happened. Okay. So one of the reasons why the flood happened is because in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it says that the sons of God, look at verse 2, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. This was a big sin against God. God was, was very displeased because of this. Who are the sons of God and the daughters of men? The sons of God are the godly offspring of the line of Seth in Genesis 5, right? And the daughters of men were the ungodly, sinful lineage of the children of Cain. God had separated these two lines because he wanted to keep the children of light pure, right? And not tainted by 
sin. And that's one of the reasons why he created the firmament to separate the waters above from the waters below. But then they started to intermingle. They started to intermarry, whether that be physical or spiritual, or it could be both. Spiritually, remember God said, Jesus said, the coming of the Son of Man, right? The second coming will be like the days of Noah. Well, the, the flood happened when the waters above and the waters below all combined together. Some of that is happening right now. A lot of people are mixing God's word with human teachings and they're just jumbling it. And that's going to kill us spiritually. Okay? We need to receive only the pure word of God. Do not mix it with human thought or ideology. The sons of God were marrying the daughters of men. That could, talk, that could be talking about physical marriage, but it's also talking about spiritually, they were mixing ideas, think, mixing beliefs. Okay? And that's why this judgment happened. So the second day describes the judgment of the flood and that era. And then day three, God created land and separated it from the seas. And not only that, he had land produce uh, plants and trees with seed. So the key words on day three were seed and land. That reminds us of Abraham, right? That's the first person whom God had covenanted to promise to give to him seed and land. Okay. So God called him out from Ur of the Chaldeans and told him to go to the land that I will show you, the land of Canaan, right? Also his descendants, the Israelites, were formed in this similar fashion. How were they formed? They were formed when God brought them out of Egypt and had them cross the Red Sea. And when they crossed the Red Sea, how did they cross the Red Sea? Just like on day three, God said, let the waters gather to one side and let dry land appear. Right? And that's exactly what happened. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 16 and verse 21, that's exactly what happened when they crossed the Red Sea. The waters parted, the waters gathered to one side and dry land appeared and they walked on dry land. So the Israelites were formed by like this, um, the land of the day three, right? So that's what we studied up until last week. So today we're going to be studying from day four, but now Right at the end of day three, this is what I need to show you. Remember, we told, I told you that God was addressing these three issues, formlessness, void, and darkness. He addressed darkness on day one, right? Now, from days one through three, he was also addressing formlessness because days one through three are basically structuring the form, okay? So let me draw you a chart here. So it's going to be form and filling. On day one, he, cre he created light and darkness. Called it day and night. On day four, which corresponds to day one, he created the sun, moon, and the stars, right? They correspond to each other, right? Light and sun, night and the moon and the stars. Okay. So on day one, he created the form, the outer structure, the framework. And then on day four, he filled it in. He created the, the realm of light, called it day. Created the realm of darkness, called it night. And on day four, he filled the realm of day with the sun. The sun is to rule over the day, and the moon is to rule over the night. Okay. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. So then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for, years, for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, that's the sun, right? 
and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. And God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a fourth day. You see? The sun is to govern the day and the moon is to govern the night. So he created the form, the outer framework, and then he filled it in. On day two, he created the expanse called heaven. And then he separated the waters above from the waters below, right? The corresponding day is day five, where he created the birds and the fish, the fishes, right? The birds fill the heavens, right? They fly in the heavens. And the fish fill the waters below, the, the seas. Okay? And then on day three, God created land and the seas. And day six corresponds to this, where he fills the land with... The seas have already been filled on day five, right? So on day six, he fills the land with what? With man and beast. And then on day seven, there's Sabbath rest. So this is the, the basic structure of Genesis chapter one, verses one through chapter two, verse four. Okay. So the first three days form, the four, days four through six are filling the void. Okay. So that's how God addresses the formlessness, the void, and the darkness. All right, so now uh, we're going to start study day four. As I said, God created the sun, moon, and the stars, right? The sun is to rule over the day. Moon is to rule over the night. Okay. So last week we said that one day would be sort of like around 1,000 years, right? Why do I say that? That's based on 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, right? I mean, 2 Peter, I'm sorry. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. So for God, one day is like a thousand years. So each day is sort of like a thousand years, about. It's not exact. Don't say, oh, that's like thousand and one years, so that goes over. It's not like that. It's around. It's a round number. So it's talking about a long period of time, about a thousand years. Because from Adam to Noah is about a thousand years. From Noah to Abraham and to the Israelites, about a thousand years. Okay? So day one would be like, because Adam was created uh, or formed on 4114 BC. Day one would be like 4,000 to 3,000. Day two would be like 3,000 to 2,000. This is BC years, right? Going backwards. Day three would be like 2,000 to 1,000, right? That means day four would be like 1,000 to year one. There is no year zero, by the way. So what event in history of redemption would correspond to this to the sun and the moon the sun is obviously jesus christ right who was born in 4 bc right in this era right what about the moon the moon gives a reflection of the sun it does not have its own light so the moon would be uh, Old Testament prophets because they did not give their off their own light. Only Jesus has his own light. We just reflect the light of Christ, right? So the Old Testament prophets testified from a distance about the coming of the Son of Man. They pointed towards the sunrise. It's coming during this dark night, right? And the last of the prophets was John the Baptist. So he's another moon. 
And then who else? The religious leaders, uh, the Jewish religious leaders can also be described as moons if they faithfully testify to the coming of Jesus. The law of the Old Testament could be said to be like the moon. Okay. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. So what was the purpose of the law? The law was to lead us to Christ. It points us to Christ. So in a sense, it's like a moon. That's what all of these people were supposed to do. They're all supposed to point their finger to Jesus Christ. That's what the moon does, right? The moon receives the sunlight and reflects it to the people living during the night nighttime okay? to shine light for them. But the thing is this, once the sun rises, there is no, no more need for the moon. The moon is unnecessary. But the problem is this, when Jesus came, the Israelites, they were still holding on to the Old Testament prophets. They were still holding on to the law. They were still holding on to the religious leaders. And these guys were not faithful in pointing and testifying towards Jesus. In fact, these are the ones that killed Jesus, right? So that's why in John 1, 5, it says, The light came and shone upon the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. This is not talking about actual light and darkness. It's talking about people. Jesus came as the light. And the darkness that was upon the Israelites, they did not understand Jesus' word. They did not know who he was. So our senior pastor, Reverend Abraham Park, used to give this example a lot. For example, Moses was a prophet who was pointing towards the Son, Jesus Christ, right? And the Israelites, they were, if they had received his testimony well and understood it, then they would have gone to Jesus, right? But they didn't. What were they doing? When, Jesus, uh, when Moses said, look, there is the sun. Like when I point my finger, there it is. You're supposed to look at the thing that the finger is pointing at, right? But what did the Jews do? They looked at the tip of Moses' finger and said, yes, there is the sun right there. And Moses is like, no, no, that's not the sun. The sun is over there, right? That's basically what they were doing. So in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, we get this woman dressed with the sun. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. This woman clothed with the sun is the symbol for the true church of the end times because she is clothed with the sun, Jesus Christ. And where's the moon? The moon is under her feet. That means she has overcome it. She received the teaching of the moon when she was still a babe. But now she went over that and she has finally gotten to Christ. She has gotten to know Christ, who he is, and has received him, and has fellowship with him, and has become one with him. That's what we need to do. We all have to overcome the moon. When we are babes in Christ or just starting out, we need the moon. When we were living in darkness, we need the moon. But once we grow out of it, that has to be under our feet. We need to be clothed with the sun. But the Israelites 2,000 years ago were unable to do that. That was the problem. So we need to grow in Christ to be clothed with the sun. And the moon needs to be under our feet. We need to overcome it. Okay. So that's day four. And then day five, God created the birds and the fish, and he created the sea monster. Okay. Let's go look at that. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. So God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let's, let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. 
So look, God created the birds to fill the heavens and the fish and the sea monsters to fill the, the seas. What the, this time period corresponds to AD now, 1 through 1000. So this is now in the church era, okay, the early church. Okay, so what is this teaching us? Birds, what are birds? Birds are beings that fly in heaven, right? Fly across heaven, okay? So uh, I'm just going to call these spirit-filled saints. Not all birds are good, but the good ones are the spirit-filled saints. In the Bible, birds like eagles are have a, a good description, right? We need to receive the wings of eagles and fly on a high. For example, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, it describes people who hope in God as eagles mounted on high, on, on eagles' wings, right? Also in Luke chapter 3, verse 22, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, heavens opened, and what happened? He received the Holy Spirit, right? And how does the Bible describe the Holy Spirit? It says the Holy Spirit came upon him like dove, like a dove. Okay, let's look at that. Luke chapter 3, verse 22. And the Holy Spirit des descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, right? That's a bird, right? So the Holy Spirit is described in terms of a bird. In Genesis 1-2 also, remember, the Spirit of God was flying over the surface of the waters. Description like a bird. Okay. So during this time, what happened? Well, after Jesus resurrected and went to heaven on the day of Pentecost, what happened? The disciples received the Holy Spirit for the first time. And the church was born. Okay. Now, what about the other side? The fish and the sea monster. I'm not going to talk about the fish too much, but in the Bible, the sea is not a good thing. It's salty water. You can't even drink it, right? It doesn't even sustain you. The sea is a symbol for the fallen world, okay? the fallen secular world. Okay? The sea symbolizes the fallen secular world. So let's look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. This water, the, the oceans on earth where the harlot, the spiritual prostitute sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues, right? So it, the fish and the sea monster are those that are living in it. They're just drenched in it, in the worldly world, right? The secular world. And especially the sea monster. I want to talk about the sea monster here. In Hebrew, the word is tanin, which is translated as sea monster. Sometimes it's translated as serpent. Sometimes it's translated as dragon. So if you look in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1, it talks about this sea monster, the tanin. In that day, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, and Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. This is strange, right? So who is this Leviathan? Leviathan is some kind of a mythical sea creature, maybe like a crocodile or... I mean, nobody really knows. Okay? We've heard of the word, right? Because it's biblical. And then God is describing the Le Leviathan like a fleeing serpent, like a twisted serpent, and also like a dragon. And it says he will kill the dragon. It's talking about Leviathan. God's going to kill Leviathan. The word for dragon here in Hebrew is tannin. Same word here. Okay. So why did I bring this up? This may be a little bit difficult to understand, but I want to talk about this. Um, have you guys heard of the book called Leviathan by a guy named Thomas Hobbes? This was written in the 17th century. Who's, who, who's heard of this book called Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes? It's a political philosophy book. So what is this book about? It's about 
politics, about the social contract. The, the ruler and the people have a contract with each other. The ruler is supposed to protect the people. The people are supposed to obey the ruler. And that, back then it was the king, right? But why did he name the book Leviathan? I want to show you the cover of that book. This was the original cover of that book, Leviathan, right? And look, this is Leviathan right here. This, this, see, this is the ocean here. It's coming out of the ocean. The head is the king. And what are all these things right here? They're the people. The body is made up of all the people. So basically, this guy is saying the nation state is like a Leviathan. Okay. The nation is like a Leviathan. The head is the king of the nation and the people are the body of the nation. Okay. I don't think this guy had any idea why he was saying that. He took the word Leviathan out of the Bible, but he did not know what he was really talking about, the meaning of it. But I think it's appropriate here because... In the secular, after 17th century, these nations started to come up, right? All the nations that we have now in Europe and America later were started to get, get formed during this time, right? And these nations are like this sea monster. And that is like the beast that comes from the sea in Revelation chapter 13. This beast is going to fight against Christ, right? Well, basically right now, the secular nations of this world are in opposition against Christ. That's going to start to happen in the modern era, right? And that's, you know, what the fifth day is teaching us, that it's going to start to happen like that. These nations, they are controlled underneath by the dragon, the sea monster, by the devil. They may not, they don't have to be a wicked nation but the, all the secular nations of the world are driven by these beastly instincts and beastly goals and objectives. And they are standing in op opposition to Christ. Oops. Let's look at Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 and the following. Look at this. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand against the rulers. Uh, uh, again, take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. See? The nations and the kings of the earth take their stand against his anointed, Christ, Jesus. Right? That started happening on the fifth day. Okay? And that, so the fifth day is the separation of the church the true church who are filled with the spirit of God like the birds and the nations of the earth, which is, which is controlled by the beast within, the beast in the sea, right? And then day six, finally, uh, corresponds to um, AD 1000 to 2000, right? So we are in this era. Remember, don't be like too... It's not like exact numbers, right? We're over 2,000, obviously, but we're in this era right now. And this is when God created man and beast. So this is man in the image of God. And this beast is not just talking about animals, but what else? Let's look at Psalm 49, verse 2, one more time. Uh, verse 20. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish, right? So man who, who, do, who do not have the understanding of God's word, who do not have the spirit of God, are like beasts in the Bible. And especially in Revelation, in 13, we have the two beasts. The beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. So day six is a foreshadowing of the battle between man in the image of God and the man in the beast, the man in the image of the beast. 
those who have accepted the beastly worldview, which I've been talking about throughout this Bible study, right, are like the beasts or are the man in the image of the beast. Those of us who have received the true word of God are man in the image of God. The word man here in Hebrew is Adam, right? Adam is not a proper noun. It's just, uh, it just means human or man. And here in Genesis 1, it's very interesting because it jumps back and forth from singular and plural. So look at, it says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, right? Let them, that's talking about the man, Adam. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. That's singular now, right? And then he goes, male and female, he created them. That's plural. And then verse 28, God blessed them. And God said to them, plural again, right? So it goes back and forth, but mostly plural. Only time they're singular is right here in 27, where it says, in the image of God, he created him. Okay? So how are we to uh, understand this? We're to understand Adam here as a collective. Man in the image of God. signifies the covenant commun community that is in Christ. Okay. And where he, where it says he created him, created him in his image. That part was singular, right? Well, there's a reason for that. Because first of all, it's talking about the returning Christ. Because Jesus, first and foremost, Jesus is the image of God, right? Jesus is the true image of God. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. It says, He... He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He here is Jesus, right? Jesus is first and foremost the image, the true image of the invisible God, right? And then we who are in Christ will take on the image of God through Jesus. Okay, let's look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians... Chapter 4, verse 4 says, uh, or this also says that Christ is the image of God, right? Oh, sorry, let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. It says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So this is what God, God's plan is. He wants, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the full image of God, right? And then those who are in Christ, those who believe in Christ, then they would take on the image of the son, Jesus Christ, and therefore they would get the image of God, right? So the first person with the image of God was Adam, but he fell. And then Jesus is the full image of God. And those of us who believe in Jesus will receive the image of God through Jesus, right? So that's what the sixth day creation of Adam is talking about. So man here is a collective. These are the, the ones who follow Christ wherever he leads. And so through Christ, we have been conformed into God's image. And we are forming this one body, one Adam. This is the last Adam, the returning Christ, right? Versus the beast that comes from the earth and the sea. Okay. The beasts from the sea are the secular nations and its kings, right? The beast from the earth was the false prophet, right? So the, the a six is a foreshadowing of the final that will happen in the end times. When Christ and his army fight against the beast and its followers. 
And what's the conclusion? Let's go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Amen. See, this is the conclusion. When the seventh angel sounds at the last trumpet, this is what's going to happen. Okay. So what we need to do is not just know Christ with our head, but we need to become like him. We need to take on his image. We need to conform to his image. Okay. So let's look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. See? We don't know exactly what we're going to be yet, but when he appears, meaning the returning Christ, when he appears, we're going to become like him because we will see him just as he is. Where it says we will see him just as he is, it means we will believe in him. Because remember, when Jesus first came, a lot of the Jews saw him, but they didn't believe in him. So they didn't see him as he is. They saw him as son of Joseph, a carpenter. But if you see him as he is, he is the son of God. He is God himself. He is the image of God. He is the creator God. He is, you know, God the Father, right? When we see him as he is like this, then we need to take on his image. We need to be conformed to his image. The point of us receiving the word like this, doing Bible studies, not just to have head knowledge, because knowledge puffs up, right? That's what the Bible says. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, what does it say? Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Knowledge makes you arrogant and proud. If we just receive God's word as knowledge, that's not good. What, what needs to happen is the word needs to change us to conform to the image of Christ. We need to be changed. Okay. Then we become man in the image of God, in Christ. Together, all of us together as one. Right? Then we will follow Christ as his army to fight the final battle against the beast. That's the conclusion of redemptive history. And we're in that last day. We're on day six. Okay, so we need to really just receive this word and pray so that we could be conformed to the image of Christ. And then finally, how does the creation uh, uh, finish? In Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Right? This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. That part, up to there, that's the end of this section. Okay? So what does this last seventh day signify? Why did God rest from his work? It's not because he got tired that he needed to rest. It's not like that. It means he, the, re, the word rest here means he finished his work. It's, it's, it signifies the completion of his creation work. Therefore, it foreshadows the completion of his redemptive work. And when that work is finished, that day is an eternal day. There's no night. There is no more sea. In Revelation chapter 21, there is no more night and no more sea. Okay? That's the Sabbath rest. In order for that Sabbath rest of God to come, what needs to happen? The heavens and the earth and all their hosts need to be completed. The only thing that is incomplete right now is man, human beings. We're the only ones that are not completed. If we are completed in our creation to be created in the image of God, then God's Sabbath rest will come. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 here, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts, the word hosts here in Hebrew is sabah, 
which literally means army. Okay. He describes all the things, all the things that he created in the universe as an army. When that army is completed, then God's Sabbath rest comes because that army will destroy the beastly nation, the beastly kingdom, and then God's Sabbath rest will come, right? Well, what's wrong with the army right now? It doesn't have a leader because the leader is supposed to be human beings in the image of God. What's the characteristic of an army? It's complete obedience. When the leader, when the leader gives a command in the army, you must obey, right? Well, everything else in the universe obeys God except for man. Man is the only thing that doesn't obey God. So God is waiting for that right now, for man to be finished in his creation work so that Together with Christ, we will fight this final battle against the beastly kingdom, against the beastly worldviews, so that God will have his Sabbath rest. So I pray that all of us will receive God's word, not as just head knowledge, but as our true spiritual nourishment. May we just cherish it and take it in every day so that it will change us from within. We need to be changed to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's the point of the creation. That's what God is waiting for right now. So let's end by reading Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 3, uh, 20 and 21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Amen. See, we're waiting for Christ so that he will come and will do what? He will transform our bodies to conform to his image. That's what we're waiting for. I pray that all of us who have received this word will have this transformation take place in our lives so that we could truly enter into the true Sabbath rest with our Father in heaven. And I pray this blessing upon all of you in the name of the Lord. And let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace in giving us this Bible study. Father God, we have, in a short span of time, just breezed through Genesis chapter 1, the work of creation. There are so many more things that we need to cover, but we have covered just the basics right now. God, I pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to each and every one of us and give us your wisdom from heaven so that we will have the wisdom to be able to understand your word that we have learned today, that it may truly bear fruits in our hearts so that we could be transformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you will let this word take effect in our hearts and change us from within, so that we could truly become the army of Christ in these last days. We thank you so much for everything and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.